skeleton can live without you, but you can't live without a skeleton. Welcome to a new episode of Ghoulish. I am Max Booth, a host, and sometimes my voice gets really deep and sometimes it doesn't. It depends how spooky I'm trying to sound. This is a podcast where I talk to you know, people, about spooky things, because we love spooky things here at Ghoulish. Today on the show, I have W.P. Johnson, author of the new collection, The Eight Eyes That Watch You Die, a spidal-themed body hull collection, out now from my own publishing company, Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. It's out right goddamn now, folks. Get a perpetualpublishing.com. You will find it. The Eight Eyes That Watch You Die by W.P. Johnson. What are we talking about today? We are talking about spiders, movie theaters, uh, you know, maybe other things, but mostly spiders because he did write a spider collection called, once again, God damn it, The Eight Eyes That Watch You Die by W.P. Johnson. Let's, let's go ahead and listen to that now because, I mean, let's be honest, how much longer do you want this intro to be? You've probably already skipped past it. So, all right, let's go on. Now I'm going to laugh really spookily until I cough, and then the show will begin. <laughs> what, what do I call you? Do I call you WP? Do I call you Bill? No, just call me Bill. Okay. <laughs> we, can, we should talk about that too, actually. Well, it's going now, man. This is the podcast. Yeah, this is the official beginning of the episode. Me asking you what your name is. Uh, yeah, so uh, it, it's Bill. No, no, I mean anyone that knows me personally um, does not think of me as W. P. Johnson or um, even a writer, really, because I don't talk too much about it. But uh, when I was uh, writing early on and speculating on how I should sell stories. I would uh, use Bill Johnson, and those are the two most common, you know, white person names in the United States that you could think of. So, and then I tried, maybe I'll go with uh, William Barkhorn. Barkhorn's my wife's last name, but we weren't, we weren't married then. And I thought, like, what if I start writing and then we don't, you know, what if it doesn't work out or something? Then I have all these stories with someone else's last name on it. And, uh, I kind of had this weird anxiety that my parents would be upset if I use someone else's last name. So uh, W.P. Johnson's the easiest thing to, it's the easiest thing to Google. Like there's no one else dumb enough to have that name except for me. It's not a dumb name. What, nothing's wrong with W.P. It sounds uh, sophisticated. It shows up right away. It does sound sophisticated, but I am not though. <laughs> So that's why, yeah, I feel like I I snuck into uh, an expensive restaurant with this name. Eventually, they will uh, realize you will not the Sausage King of Chicago. They will know that very soon. Yeah. So you wrote a book about spiders. Why? Yeah. Can you explain to me before we talk about that why why ghoulish? Why do you call it ghoulish? Because I like saying ghoulish. <laughs> That's it. It's really okay. amusing to me to say it that way. Well, no, I just thought it's interesting that uh, it was a, I think as described, a comedy podcast about horror or something like that. Pretty much. Uh, I have a lot of, uh, I get a lot of ideas for podcasts I want to do, and then I don't do those. So I decided to just make one show that anytime I get, like an idea for a different podcast, I can just make it an episode of one uh, strict program. Because, I mean, catch me in the right mood, and I'd be like, hey, hey, Bill, you want to do an ongoing podcast about uh, Spidles? And I would hate myself. Now I can just do one episode of it and be done. Okay. So Ghoul is just sort of like the the uh, vehicle for any any kind of discussion you want to have, essentially. 
Yeah. Uh, okay, so what the the one of the longest stories in there, um, the God of Dead Dreamers was is about a man who goes on a cruise ship, and he uh, goes down to Antarctica and becomes a spider. That's like the like the the boiling it down to its simple pe- simplest pieces. But I had the idea when I was on a cruise ship. And we were traveling, and it was a it was a long uh, it was a long cruise. It was like five days at sea. Um, and it's like two and a half down, two and a half back. And I just remember thinking, like, what if it just kept going? Like, if it didn't go back, if it just kept going south, and it came from that. Like, literally, like, like you know how stories are. They they don't. It's not like you think of a story and it's all there. It's always some small little thing, and it, it you just kind of build on it and build on it. Um, and there was nothing about spiders. I just thought, what if he, uh, keeps going down to Antarctica? Like, why is he going there? What's the point of that? What happens to him? And at the same time, I was aggressively writing short stories and trying to break into markets and stuff. And there was a a magazine called Lovecraft Zine. I don't know if it's still even around anymore, but I think it is. I think, yeah, I kept submitting. I submitted maybe like four or five things to him. And every time he said, this isn't Lovecraftian. And I thought, okay. So I would try another thing and another thing. And and then I kind of realized, you know what? I don't even like Lovecraft. Like, why am I even doing this? Um, <laughs> so I, I stopped submitting to him. And yeah. But this story was sort of like my last ditch effort to like try to write a weird uh, Lovecraftian tale. But it ended up not becoming that at all. Because, you know, you can't, you can't force yourself to... Uh, what would you call it? Like right to order or whatever. Um, it's difficult to it's difficult to pick a theme someone else has chosen and write based on that theme. Yeah, yeah. There's something about it that just doesn't work for me. If 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 I sit down and someone says you're going to write a vampire story, I'm like okay, like I have no, I could try, but if it goes somewhere else, then it goes somewhere else, and then I got nothing. Ooh, you could write a vampire spidal book. <laughs> yeah, I should do that. No, you should. Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> maybe I should. I I don't know if I'll ever write another short story again. I, I think I think my mojo for it is gone. That's okay. I mean, it, you, yeah. you, you have this book, and if anyone ever says, "Hey, hey, Bill, how can we not write short stories?" You could say, "I already mastered the craft with this collection." I've done all I've said all I wanted to say, but it started from that. And then uh, my wife, well, you guys tell put dream dress, dream dress together. Yeah. And um, she said to me, you should write a horror story about Lolita's, which if people who are listening, Lolita is like a like a subgenre of, of fashion. And it's sort of um, kind of, I don't know if I don't know how you explain it, but they they're like a big part of like anime cons. And that was another thing I just thought about kind of obsessively until something kind of clicked. And it was another spider story, just kind of coincidentally. It's not like I thought, I'm going to write eight of these. I thought, I wrote one, I wrote a second one. And then after that, I thought, I'll just keep writing these. I'm just going to keep writing spider stories until I run out of ideas. And then I thought of the idea of writing like a whole book of them. And then I got really stoned and pitched a few people on the on the internet. (laughs) <laughs> I think I like went to uh, who's the guy who does uh, Broken River books? J. David Asbilm. <laughs> yeah, I think I email. I think I messaged him like, "Hey man, I'm like really out of it right now." But what do you think about this? And he said, "That's not really our thing, but good luck, buddy." <laughs> Sounds <laughs> was, like him. He was really, he was really nice actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then um, then I emailed you. And then you said, that sounds weird. Send it to me when you're done. And then that's now we're here. Oh, my God. So what began this yeah. obsession with spidals, though? <laughs> uh, honestly? Yeah. There's a there's a book called All the King's Men. It's like an old, uh, I think it's like written in the 40s. It's a fiction book. But there was this narrative uh, thing that they kept coming back to that called the Oh God! It's called like the Great Twitch or something, or or the the Great Web, and it was this this recurring theme that of all things being connected and time being like a web and uh, the strands of time kind of 
you know, if you if you do something that creates uh, events that affect other things and so on and so on. So he calls it the great twitch. And I, I, this, that never left me. That idea of like a, a web representing um, like existence, like your entire life like that. Yeah, man, uh, that's some uh, true detective shit, man. You would, yeah. Yeah. Time is a flat web. Oh, my God. Time is a flat web. That's what the quote was, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, time is a flat web. Uh, so I don't know. I, I don't I don't have any um, reasons for liking spiders or not liking them. It was just it just one thing led to another. And before you know it, you've got 300 pages of spider stories. Do you uh, do you do you find spiders like like gross or icky in real life? Like if you encounter one, say, in the bathroom at 2 a.m., are, are you panicking or what's going on? I don't really like bugs in general, but uh, I generally don't kill spiders if I see them. Good. Because they, they kill other bugs, so I kind of leave them alone. Yeah, okay. Well, that's good of you. I'm, I'm glad. I would love to have a traumatic story of why I wrote all this, but there isn't one. Can you just make one up now? <laughs> sure. Okay, cool. <laughs> you know, when I, when I was... Um, actually, there's two things I remember as a kid. These are actually these are real stories too, not not like fake stories. Oh, but okay. I remember um, my dad and I we took apart a Volvo station wagon and replaced the entire engine. I don't know shit about cars either, so I was just basically, you know, tightening screws, loosening bolts, doing this, doing that, you know, cleaning stuff. And he needed me to go underneath the car to take apart. I don't know what it was. It was like something attached to the oil oil pan and it was a really old car and uh it sat around for a while and you know when when cars sit around like things start to live in them they like move in basically and uh i kind of put my back on that little i don't know what you call it it's like this little it looks like it like a big flat skateboard but big enough for your entire body to lay on it so i slid underneath it and the car is not even jacked up because I forget why, but the oil pan was maybe maybe like two inches away from my face, and there was this giant spider that built a nest in it. I mean, it was like one of those spiders whose legs are tiny, but its its butt and stuff was huge. I was like thick. it was gonna burst any second. Yeah, it's really thick. Nice ass, I got you. It had a really nice ass on it. I got right out, told my dad, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, why? I said, there's a really big spider under there. And he said, all right. So he did it. But I think deep down, I think he saw the spider and was like, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why he originally had you do it. <laughs> yeah. He probably said, you, you go and do it. <laughs> nice. And you said you had the a other, second one? Yeah. The other thing was uh, I had the, the flu. And I used to... Um, I used to like sleep in my parents' room because they had a TV in there. So I remember being in the the room, and I'm like maybe like nine or something, and there was always uh, coke coke cans by the t- like on the on the nightstand. Like they would drink or whatever, they would just leave them around. They wouldn't finish them. And I'm just a kid. I, I just grab it and just start drinking it. So anyway, I'm sitting there sick, and I grab this Coca Cola can. And it's flat. Like I don't care. So I start sipping it. And I feel something like touching my lip. And then when I pull the can back, there's probably like, I don't know if it was a wolf spider or what, but it, it had its claw like on my lip because yeah. it had built a nest inside the Coke can. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I had something. I like uh, this. Now. <laughs> the, uh, oh, oh. <laughs> I imagine anyone very... listening is doing the same noise. <laughs> if they're really honest, like, oh. <laughs> yeah i had something similar happen to me but it was a uh, cigarette butts in the uh, coke can my uh my brethels would constantly leave cigarette butts inside of coke cans and then i would drink it and vomit yeah i used to live in in uh chester with some friends of mine and i for people who like live around uh the philadelphia area chester's like pretty shitty and we uh 
had this apartment that we, you know, I'm like my mid twenties and they're all kind of like, you know, punk hardcore people, not that I was, but they were like my friends and they had a place to stay. So I moved in with them, but we treated that place like garbage. I mean, we used to spit on the ground, put cigarettes out in the wall, throw knives at the wall. And I, I'll never forget that. Um, we started just as a joke, just started chewing tobacco. It was just like a thing was to start chewing. That's like, okay. a joke. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We were just like very like we were all like in college. We worked part time. The place was dirt cheap. It cost me two hundred a month to live there. You know, I just just moved out, and it was that you know, it's that time in your life when you you have when you can like shake a hangover off the next day, and no, no problem. You know, just keep going. Like I'm like I can't even wrap my head around doing these things now. But uh, we used to trash this place, and I'll never forget. Uh, we all started chewing tobacco and, and sharing the same uh, coffee mug to spit into. <laughs> and uh, the next day, like it was me, my buddy Sean, and uh, roommate Chelsea, we were also friends with. We we're all like drinking coffee, and we were all like really hungover. And she grabbed the the spit one by accident and drank from it. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I would rather (laughs) drink a Spital at that point. (laughs) Like, really disgusting. That's awful. I think my, uh, yeah, my my brother has a good spider story from when he was a kid. He, uh, he was maybe like, it, it, anyone listening will know where this is going. The ending's kind of already blown just by nature of this being about spiders, but he was on, he was like nine, maybe eight, and he had a big puffy winter jacket. And he was on the school bus and he's just a little kid, you know, he doesn't know what's going on. And he feels his jacket kind of shaking and he's like, what is going on? And he opens his jacket and in the side, probably like 200 little spiders are just crawling out of his jacket because there is an egg sac inside of it. So what, did <laughs> they just like explode the bus? And Honestly, the I don't, come in? I think it's, um, one of those stories that is like the reality is so bad. You don't remember what happened afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> you just got like, you reach the end and you cut to credits basically. Cause <laughs> whatever you did was just, like, whatever rant you probably pissed yourself, blacked out, like who knows what, but he, he t- remembers telling me like, I like ripped my jacket off and screamed. And then I don't, I don't think he remembers what happened after that. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it was too much. When I was a kid, a my, thing, when I was a kid, my uh, brother's best friend got bit by uh, some type of spider on the leg, and it got infected. And he refused to go get medical treatment, and at one point, it just be- became like this hole in his leg, and he would just like freak people out by sticking his fingers into it. That's pretty fucking gnarly, man. It it kind of is. Uh, fun fact: I've never seen a spider in real life. Oh, come on. Any kind. Really? Yeah, if you showed me one right now, I would be like, what's that? You ever go to the zoo? No. You should. <laughs> you should go. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff there. <laughs> like what? Are you a sheltered person, Max? Is this, <laughs> have you ever left the hotel or the house <laughs> you live in? I mean, I do have a <laughs> chain around my ankle connected to this front desk. <laughs> You probably go blindfolded folded to work every day. I do, yeah. They put a bag yeah. over my head and drive me in the back seat. I was just going to say you do, the, you do the bird box challenge to work I to do. and from. Yeah. And that's how he got the idea for that novel. I told him about how I go to my job, and he was like, oh, I got I to gotta write a book about that. You know, um, Josh, is, he's he's a really sweet guy. Uh, he... Um, I mean, we're both fans, obviously, Like, but I read that book a few years ago, and I was, like, so blown away. I couldn't believe how good that fucking book was. And, um, like, I think I read it in two days. I can't remember. I can count on on one hand the amount of books I've read in two days like that, where okay, you just burn ahead. through it. You know? uh, Come Closer. Really, really great. That's a good one. Bird Box. Um, I don't know if it holds up as much as it used to. But when I when I was like nineteen and I read Fight Club, I read that in like I think I read that in a day. Yeah, I'm afraid. I never like that. I'm afraid to revisit most of his books. 
Yeah. I don't think they hold up as much as they do like when I was a rally teen. Yeah. It's funny because I think he inspired like the entire generation of awful writers. <laughs> like he, he like really got people fired up. And they're like, we can do this too. It's like, no, I don't, I think there's, there's, a, there's a, some more ingredients to the sauce besides like whatever it is, whatever it is he did. You know, the whole minimalist thing is, is great. There's something to it. And uh, you certainly can't take that away from him. Like his, his really great books are always going to be great. Um, but yeah, he, he really got people worked up and uh, inspired to write their awful novels including myself. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many awful stories in books I've written that um, were inspired by him, Brett Easton Ellis. That was another one too, like American Psycho. I think I read that in maybe two days. Uh, it's still, I think that still holds up actually. I know that I'm not as huge a fan of his other work, but I, I will still go back to that book now and again and, and read it. I, uh, I missed his books. I haven't read any of them. I, I mean, I saw the movie obviously, but that's about it. Yeah, his books are um, American Psycho is it's a good book. I don't I mean, I, I don't I couldn't write a thesis on it about why I like it, but it, there's something about it. It's still it still hits. It's still got some some bite to it. What do you think uh, Patrick Bateman thinks about spiders? He probably thinks that spiders are speaking to him, <laughs> like telling him jokes like, like uh, Sam. <laughs> Yeah, like that. Sam. <laughs> <laughs> He'd probably try to shove a spider into an ATM, right. um, or eat a spider because it cause he thinks it has a soul. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other books that I've read in like two days flat. There's probably a Stephen King book. I know, like, like it. I read really quickly. Wow. Uh, when I was 20, I think. Speaking of spinal books. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but I think part of the reason I read it so quickly is because that book, like I've read it three times. It's one of the, there, there aren't a lot of books that I reread, but that one, um, American psycho 1984 and all the King's men I've, I've read multiple times. And every time I read it, it still scares me. It still kind of freaks me out a little bit. It's a good one. Yeah. I it's a, a fucking really good one. The last book I re uh, read at least more than once, was a collection called The Eight Eyes That Watch You Die. <laughs> Had to read that one multiple times. Yeah. 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 I, I, uh, I hope more people read it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I hope we start, yeah, I hope we start seeing some reviews, you know? Well, you know, after this podcast, it's going to become a New York Times bestseller, I think. Yeah. I, I, I'm like writing notes to, of things to go back to because there's other stuff that during our conversation so far that I like want to circle back to. But that book, I mean, like I reread it after you got me notes and I hadn't looked at it in a while. And I remember thinking like, this is a really good fucking book. Like this is like, this is like pretty wild. I agree. Do you want to talk about like how you managed to connect them all? Because I think that's pretty I, cool. I don't, I don't, uh... I don't know, man. I just like every story has its initial um, inspiration. Yeah, I guess you'd have to go through them like one by one, you know, and just think like, who are these people? What do they want? And how does this fit in that shared universe of all the other stories? So for people listening who haven't like read it or read details, it's about a collection of stories that all feature this drug called silk. And that's kind of really, it's more about silk than it is about spiders, to be totally honest. Um, but silk is created by spiders, so every story has a character that's kind of obsessed with getting it. Um, or they're sort of victim to another character that's trying to get it, or someone who creates it. So the opening story, uh, Bitten, is about this couple that they meet a boy who uh is a spy i don't know i don't i don't know how much i want to say it, it ends poorly for them to say the least uh that's kind of like really watering it down but yeah it doesn't end well for them 
I would say that's one of the creepiest stories in the collection. It really uh, is effective. Yeah, there's a. Uh, all I'll say is that uh, my wife and I went to a haunted house, like maybe like two years, maybe uh, probably like four years ago at this point. And we were walking around, and one of the one of the rooms was a, a clown house. It all circles back to to it and stuff. I think it had just come out or was about to come out. And this little kid, I mean, he was like six years old, probably, with, with clown makeup on, ran right up to me and said, can I bite you? <laughs> and it really fucking freaked me out, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> so it kind of came from that. Yeah. I can, so here I are these two that. characters. Yeah. Sitting in a movie theater, this this husband and wife. And the other part of the story, too, it was a, it was about an atheist and a Christian uh, being married. Mm-hmm. Um, cause my, my wife and I are very different in terms of belief. So I wanted to kind of explore that a little bit. And this kid sitting next to the guy saying, smelling him going like, can I bite you? And they're just kind of annoyed. It's like, you should stay quiet. And he says, yeah, but you smell really good. You smell tasty. And just kind of going from that and building on it and building on it and kind of like, uh, freaking myself out a little bit. Yeah. I'm sure writers can uh, relate to that sense of like surprising yourself, but also if you're writing something scary, sort of like giving yourself anxiety with something. That's the best type of writing. Movie theaters kind of freak me out a little bit too. Like movie theaters are, um, this is a fear that I'm afraid to even talk about, but I've always been afraid of being in a movie theater and having someone slip my throat, like to the point where sometimes I grab my neck, um, it like makes me kind of like upset to go to a movie theater, but I, I you know, I usually forget it. But uh, how long have you been afraid of that? I think for maybe like a decade at least. Uh, probably for a long time because I remember writing a story about it, trying to like exercise the uh, that kind of anxiety and fear. Yeah. Any idea like uh, what began it? I think the idea of having your throat slit is fucking freaky, man. It is. It's because, like, after it happens, you don't immediately die. You just kind of have to live with it for a few seconds. It's like having someone, like, pop an air balloon. You're, like, sinking. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's well, awful. Well, this is unsettling. <laughs> I would sit in a movie theater, and I, I would kind of look at the seat, the, the where I was sitting, and there's something about a theater... That's I guess probably in light too of some of the shootings that have happened. Oh, like yeah. movie theaters are kind of they're kind of freaky, man. It's like you're you're not on your you're not on your guard. Um, you're surrounded by strangers and you're in the dark. And there's this loud, distracting thing in front of you that is supposed to hold your attention. And part of that too makes me worried that my attention is going to be focused on this when something bad is about to happen. I think you just Wait, gave, uh, I think you just ruined <laughs> cinema. Everybody thought it would be Marvel, uh, the, the those superhero movies, but no, it was it was you who ruined cinema. I don't think it's it, like unless a movie is a movie has to be so good for me to want to go see it because because of this. Like movies are not fun to me. Like I, it has to be like I have to see this movie. Wow. Or else I'm not going. I don't blame you now. My God. It's fucking terrifying. Dude, I think of it every time. <laughs> like, Do you have to pick time. like a certain seat, like maybe all the way in the back? No, well, I don't because I don't want to be, I don't want to be weird. Okay. You know, so, yeah. I, <laughs> so I'll just sit anywhere. Like, it's almost kind of like if you're walking on the street and you see someone kind of sketchy walking towards you, you don't want to be like, you don't want to cross the street and make them feel like you're acknowledging that you're afraid of them or worried about them. So it's like, I'm just going to sit right in front of this person. (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't matter if it's a guy in a Michael Myers outfit and a knife and it's saying like, Hey, how how you doing? Sit right in front of you. Yeah. You don't want to be rude. (laughs) No, if that's the thing about my anxiety, my fear is that I think, uh, unlike most 
not not all people, but I think a lot of people it gets to them and it really affects their lives. But I've sort of uh, lived with it to the point where I just accept I'm just going to think these weird things and and just go with it. Probably everyone thinks stuff. I mean, just don't talk about it. But probably that's a co- that's a common common fear. Um, but the first like it's the first story opening in a movie theater. Part of it was exploring that fear. Part of it was exploring a married couple that are drastically different from each other, but still in love. And then the last thing was um, the body horror of this kid who is not really a boy and has the ability to make people kind of catatonic, which that doesn't give away too much, but it gives away enough to hopefully make people want to read it. I would hope so. Yeah. I mean, you haven't spoiled too much of it. It goes into some pretty, uh, awesome directions i think especially for anyone like interested in cosmic hole of any kind and the other stories like connecting them i i think it's one of the when when we think about the evolution of our artistic expression to kind of be you know hoity-toity about it but this collection i think by the time i got to these stories i kind of stopped really caring about the things that made me a bad writer i think which is you know wanting desperately to be published wanting to sell stories wanting to break into markets i just thought to myself i just want to have fun i just want to write something that is interesting to me i just want to find some interesting way to connect these things um to challenge myself because this collection again to kind of promote it for people that are listening uh, every story is like drastically different. Definitely. I mean, you have one that takes place on a cruise. You have one that takes place in like a, sh- like a strange punk rock house, which I think might be kind of an inspired by the tobacco, the tobacco chewing house you used to live in. Uh, no, I <laughs> lived in, in, uh, there's a place it's closed, but there was a place in Philly called the ox. Oh, okay. It was a real place. It was a warehouse. Um, so there's a, a story called Sheila headlines the ox about uh, a trans a trans person kind of moving into this this punk rock warehouse, which is a which is a real thing in Philly. There are a lot of warehouses in North Philly where you can live there for like almost nothing, and they would host shows there. And it was very like DIY. You know, you'd go there and and they would be building bathrooms and showers and the rooms would have no doors on them until you built them yourself. And the, the staging area was very much like something they put together. And I, and I, we played this band I was in, we played at the Ox. We opened for Ted Leo and the pharmacist. Oh, those guys. Yeah. And it was a really cool show, but it was also like, no one knew about it. Like yet only by word of mouth. Could you get to the show? Um, it wasn't promoted. Uh, you were, that you would the police would shut you down because it's breaking all sorts of it's there's all sorts there's like a million violations in having a show like that um so that was based on a real thing uh that particular yeah that particular story in that particular house and i've lived in places like that where um people are squatting people are paying to live there people kind of come and go uh there's tons of like you know like rats and bugs and spiders and all sorts of shit in there and they're they're pretty wild, man. You could definitely tell that you came from a experience writing that novelette because, I mean, it, it seemed authentic to me. And the other thing about every story being different, too, is this is kind of a weird thing to talk about because I'm not sure if I'm going to get shit for it or if people are going to say, good job. But every story is also um, tackling a very different type of character, too. So there's a there's a trans character, there's a black character, there's a lesbian couple. Um, the, I've I've never been a drug addict, so there would be a you know a drug addict character, and it it kind of begs the question of, you know, did I appropriate or did I just try to live in that headspace and and explore it a little bit? And I I don't have an answer to that question. I'm not sure. I understand why you might be concerned, but I mean, 
I I think it's I think it's healthy to try to explore points of views that don't belong like to you, essentially, especially with writing. Because if like why else will we writing if we're not trying to understand everybody? I don't know. Uh, we only had like five more minutes left of the podcast, and I and I know you prepared a a lot of jokes that you wanted to uh, pitch to me that are spital themed. If if this is how we're gonna blow the last five minutes, sure. Uh, <laughs> how do? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna tell you a joke. I'm gonna tell you a story. I'm gonna tell you a joke, and then I'm gonna tell you a story. Then we're gonna end. Okay. All right, I'm ready. Um, all right. I want to get a good one. Oh, this is a good one. How come you can never trust spiders? How come? Because they post stuff on the web. Hello. Yeah. Was that it? <laughs> it was... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, go on. Uh, well, okay, so I was going to tell you um, a quick uh, Josh Mallerman story. Okay. He uh, put out Bird Box, obviously. The movie came out wildly successful. And um, very nice man, you know, uh, kind of came at it. Not, kinda, not, not, it didn't come out of nowhere, but was suddenly here and then, and then friends of everyone in the scene, so to speak. Um, so me and this, my uh, coworker were at, were at the restaurant we work at and someone puked all over the bathroom. And there's like this little vestibule uh, hand-washing area before the restroom, right? So, and both the sinks were just clogged to vomit. And it was, it was bad, man. It was real nasty. So, me and this uh, this girl Maureen, we we go in there and we it was so bad that we had to cover our eyes and kind of feel our way towards the bathroom to run the water to unclog the sinks. Oh my god! So so I messaged Josh. I said, "Hey, uh, I don't know if I'm bugging you, but I just want you to know that someone puked all over the bathroom, and we did the bird box challenge to clean it up. Anyway, congratulations." <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was going to end with you finding out it was Josh who did the vomiting. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, he said, no, you're not bothering me at all. That's hilarious. And I said, and then I kind of went, cool. Hey, I have a book coming out. Can you read it? And then, and then I didn't hear from him. <laughs> <laughs> well, Josh, I did the classic I, thing. If, if yeah, I did the classic the podcast, thing of Josh. <laughs> what the fuck? I did the, yeah, the classic thing of, trying to build an authentic friendship and then ruining it by wanting something from him. So, <laughs> anyway, Josh, I didn't mean to do that, but I did it anyway. Uh, and then uh, here, here's another spider joke. Okay. Um, they're all web jokes, by the way. <laughs> what is the spider's favorite TV show? What? The newly web game. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really <laughs> awful. All right, here's the last story. So okay. I think the other thing that inspired this collection was kind of, I didn't even realize I was doing this, but um, I don't, I, oftentimes I think we don't realize the thing we're kind of circling when we're writing it. But um, body horror was like a real big piece of this collection. Um, and I didn't even realize I was doing it. I was like writing all these stories and then kind of looked back and thought, man, like I really, I really like tackled like some awful body horror in the story i think almost every single story has something that makes you feel kind of gives you anxiety about the the livelihood of your own flesh you know um and i think that stems from years ago i got bit by a tick and i got uh rocky horror mountain fever oh, wait no it's rocky mountain fever not rocky horror mountain fever <laughs> The other one, you uh, become a transvestite. So this one, though, uh, Rocky Mountain Fever, it uh, it's like Lyme disease, but way worse. So uh, all the skin on my hands and feet uh, died and peeled off. Uh, my nails grew and cracked because they died at the base. And I had a fever of 103 for like an entire day. So I remember going to the doctor and, and I showed him all my symptoms and he said, I think you have this thing. I'm like, OK, like. Let's let me let me take a picture of your hands. And he took a picture and, and they're all blotchy red and, and peeling. And he sent it to a friend of his and his friend sent back like, yeah, he has this thing. And as he's doing that, as I'm waiting for him to get the news, I'm Googling uh, Rocky Mountain fever and I'm finding stories. And you can do this right now. I'm finding stories of 
local woman has arms and legs amputated after getting necrosis from Rocky Mountain fever. <laughs> oh, God. I swear to God, I'm just sitting there thinking, like, that's it. It's lights out, man. Oh, no. Like, I'm done. Like, this is going to get worse, and I got, I'm, I'm going to have no, I'm, I'm saying goodbye to my hands, basically. Um, but then he got me uh, vaccines, like, right away, regardless of actual confirming di- the diagnosis, and I was able to get better. But that, I think that really kind of scarred me a little bit, because I, for like a day or two, I thought I am forever going to be um, handicapped by this. Like my, my, my body's changing irreversibly and it's never going to be the same. And, uh, that, that, like that planted something in my psyche, like real deep that is probably come out now and again in these stories, especially, I think. So if, if for anyone who's listening, if you like, if you like weird fiction or body horror, if you like spiders, um, I think the laughing tree even has some jokes in it. Uh, you'll probably like the collection. And uh, mentioning the different styles, there's one story that's all dialogue. There's one that's a play. Uh, I think that it's a really awesome piece of work that I'm really proud of, and I'm really excited that we got to work on it together. Because uh, Me too. yeah, I, I don't think I don't think anyone would have given this a chance because of how ambitious and weird it was. Nah, fuck those guys. I hope they get bit by a tick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They don't get to the doctor in time. <laughs> well, I'm glad you uh, made it to receive medical attention in time. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I don't know how you would be doing this podcast. And I remember hobbling home, unable, almost unable to walk because of my feet were swollen from it. Good God. Thinking, that's, that's it. That's it. I'm a dead man. Man, who who the how the hell do you even get bit by a tick now? Will, will you like in the Amazon? I was sitting under a tree. Ah. Um, it was summer, right? Yeah. And I had, and then the doctor even was like, "Do you have any tick bites?" I'm like, "I don't think so." And so he looked at my arms, he looked at my legs, and he said, "Drop your pants." I'm like, "All right." And I'm I'm very like, "That's fine." Like, I'll just do it. You're a doctor. Yeah. And he pulled my he pulled my like my my balls like off my leg, mm-hmm. and he found it right there. God. He found the found the bite though, not the tick. But yeah. wh- whatever whatever it was, it, it it got up in there, took a big bite, and then left. You know, two things can happen to you when you sit underneath a tree: an apple can fall on your head, and you can invent gravity. Well, you will get bit by a tick. Yeah, yeah. and you can write a collection of stories. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so. so, did you have one last web joke to end this on? Uh. Is it, if this is how we're going to end it, yeah. Let's do it. Let me find a good one, though. <laughs> how many do you have? So fucking dumb. Dude, there's like there's like 30 of them here. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. What do you get when you cross spiders with corn? I have no idea. Cobwebs. How can folks find you online, Bill? You can... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I use American Typo for everything. So on Twitter, on uh, Instagram, WordPress, uh, I'm not super active, but I, which you know, is probably discouraging to the publisher who published this book. But <laughs> eh. I'm like working every day on my next novel. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm still I'm still really active. I just don't uh, do a lot on social media, but. On those rare occasions when I do post things, it's usually on Instagram or Twitter through American Typo. So that's very easy to find. And uh, once in a blue moon, I'll, I will write a blog post kind of updating, like, this is what I'm doing right now. Nice. Well, once again, go by the eight eyes that watch you die. We will have a link in the show notes. Thank you, Bill, for, um, for coming on and tillifying my audience and also saying hilarious jokes just fucking the most hysterical jokes i've ever told in my life thank you so much you want wait 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 do you want one more i do this is this is how, this is how we're gonna end it <laughs> okay and then you're gonna you're gonna cut the black okay all right okay a man in a movie theater notices notices what looks like a spider sitting next to him he says are you a spider
And the spider says, yes. And he says, what are you doing at the movies? And the spider replied, well, I really like the book. Thank you for listening to a new episode of Ghoulish with me, Max Booth, a host. I hope you enjoyed uh, this week's episode with W.P. Johnson. Once again, go check out his new, brand new Spidal Collection, The Eight Eyes That Watch You Die, available through Perpetual Motion Machine. Go to perpetualpublishing.com, check it out. Buy it on Amazon, Bones & Noble, Indie Bound, any goddamn place you want baby and do not forget to uh you know so pull us on patreon at patreon.com slash publishing please rate and review us on itunes ghoulish a podcast by me max booth until next week live spooky die spooky Ooh.